and yeah. let's uh, spend some time growing in the Lord together. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time, for tonight. We thank you, Lord, for your presence, Lord, in our lives. And Father, we thank you that you're just not a system of beliefs and doctrines, but a person. And not only that, but you are the triune God, three distinct persons, and yet one God. And we thank you that in that unity, you have welcomed us into your divine unity, that we can know you and be one with you. As Christ is one with the Father, we can be one in you. And so, Lord, I pray that you would bring that unity between us and you tonight, between us and each other, that your church might be an example, Lord, of unity and grace and truth and joy in the Lord. And so we thank you for tonight. We thank you for all that you have planned. And we trust, Lord, that you're going to make the most out of this time with us. And may we make the most out of this time with you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Seated. Grab your catechism book or your phone that has the app on it. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it's because you haven't been here. And the New City Catechism is kind of our reference point, but I'm supplementing it with a lot of the old school catechisms that have been around for a long time. Uh, I just want to comment on the last song. You know, I think sometimes there's a quiet, peaceful hymn or song that comes our way. And it's like a cold drink of water. And it's something that we just need it. You know, there's the thing that brought me to faith in Christ more than anything was God's divine peace. I wanted peace in my life. And yeah, she agrees. <laughs> And, and honestly, I think it's something that we all deeply desire and long for, is peace. You think of most of the conflicts and troubles we have in our life, there's an absence of peace in most of those scenarios. And I was talking to one of our church members after church on Sunday, and they were asking about heaven and wanted to know about it and so we had a brief moment I kind of explained it explained the intermediate state the eternal state the new heaven and new earth and, and he said yeah but there's gonna be no sea in the new heaven and new earth and the Bible does say that you know it talks about it but I explained to him that the sea in the book of Revelation is symbolic of chaos and conflict that the beast comes out of the sea right and in the new heaven and new earth it says there's no sea because there's no conflict there's no war any longer, but there's actually peace between God and man and man and man. And I think those moments of peace with the Lord are most important for us in our walk. That we could have, be through all kinds of crazy storms, but if we know that we have peace with God first and foremost, it's going to help sustain us through whatever turbulent waters we may face. Amen? So maybe we need times of those quiet songs or silence even to just sit in some peace for a moment. If you have young kids, you're like, what is silence? I saw a look over here somewhere about that. Kids can be a little noisy. So can adults. All right, so I'm going to pray. We're going to get into week and question number 13, if you can believe that. We're making our way through. We've got 52 weeks in this plan so not even close to finishing but we're getting there why don't we pray and let's see what God does tonight in our time together father we thank you we thank you for tonight we thank you Lord for this resource but more importantly than some secondary resource it's the primary source of your word that we need most and may this resource draw us into your word further tonight there's quite a few passage we have earmarked to study I pray that we would get to all of those and all the ones that are needed and help us to understand tonight our own sinfulness. That's what this catechism question deals with. We just finished the commandments of God and we'll review that for a moment. But Lord, we need a clear understanding of our sin and our sin nature and what that means for us in light of the Savior whom we need most. And so Lord, bless this time. 
Bless our study. May you be honored and glorified in it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we did do and finish the Ten Commandments. All right. Uh, And we've covered the two tablets or tables of the law. The first four deal with how we love God. And the last six deal with how we love who? Our neighbor, right? And Jesus is the one who summarized the commandments with love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbors yourself. Jesus was specifically talking about the Ten Commandments when he made that statement. And it is the simplest, most obvious requirement for all of mankind is that we must love God the way he has called us to love him, not just however we make it up, and how we're to love our neighbor the way he says we are to love them, right? But now we come to, I mean, we'll finish review 9 and 10. So the ninth commandment, anybody remember what that one is? Okay. If you just say the word lying, that'll help you know, right? It's you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. So don't say something against your neighbor that is untrue. Bearing false witness, slandering them, speaking evil of them, lying, all of these things fall under this commandment. Remember, these commandments are an umbrella for other sinful practices. So what does the ninth require? That we do not lie, deceive, but speak the truth in love, right? That's kind of important. That the motive behind speaking truth is a love for that person, not a hate, which we could easily fall into either one, right? So he wants us to speak the truth in love, but not to lie or deceive in any way. And then the 10th commandment, you remember that one? Covet. What does it mean to covet? What's that? Envy, want. Um, that's right. It's a, it's a ungodly desire for things that are not yours. So we get examples of not coveting your neighbor's house, his wife, his donkey, his cattle, whatever they may own, do not covet those things, right? And yet, what does it require? That we are content, not envying anyone or resenting what God has given them or us. That we would be content with what God has given. I mean, it's really easy to be content with our lives, isn't it? Yeah, we should be. And yet, however, no matter where you are in the world, no matter how much somebody has or how little, being discontent and wanting more is kind of the human condition, is it not? And you'll find that the breaking of these Ten Commandments is something that comes naturally to us. It comes because of our inherited sinful nature. And that's what we start to deal with tonight, and we'll cover as much as we can Uh, One of the fancy terms for it is the depravity of man, meaning how fallen or depraved or sinful are we? And that's a good question. I mean, have you ever heard somebody talk about somebody like, oh man, they are such a good person? Or somebody might have a new girlfriend or boyfriend and you ask them about them, well, what are they like? Are they a Christian? Like, well, they believe in God. Well, that's not enough. All the pagans of the old world believed in God or gods, right? Well, do they believe in Jesus? Well, they're a really good person. You ever heard that one? Yet the Bible would answer, nobody's good. Wait a minute, there's good people out there. The Bible would say, no, not one. Isn't that interesting? So we're going to have to unpack what does it mean to be a good person in God's eyes? What does it mean that we are not good in God's eyes? And what's the solution? How do we resolve this? Because deep down, we all think we're good people. Even though we failed, maybe horribly at times, we still think deep down, well, we we try to do good, and we're a good person. And yet it's important for us to understand our own sinfulness. Because the more we realize and understand our own capacity for sin and the reality of the sins we have committed and how grievous they are to God, the more we will understand how great His love is for us. Put it this way. 
If we're constantly justifying and minimizing our sin, then we think that the debt God paid for us is, really wasn't that big. But if we realize the gravity of what we actually have earned with our life based on our works and what we deserve, and that debt is so high and so great, then God's love is so much greater. For instance, somebody comes along and let's say that you owe somebody 10 bucks. And they go, hey, you know what? I'm going to pay that 10 bucks. And you're like, oh, like, thank you. Right? You'd be, I mean, that, that's very nice of you. Thank you. But what if you owed a couple million dollars and you're going to be separated from your family and all you love and you'll have no freedom but be locked up until that final penny is paid and you can't pay it and somebody comes along and pays it all. Whose love seemed greater? The person who paid for $10 or the person who paid for $2 million? Two million. Yet constantly we are trying to minimize our debt and be like, well, I'm, I'm a good person. You know, Jesus saved me, but he didn't have to save me from that much. Now, we'd never be so bold to say that. But we think it. We think it. But the more we are willing to accept how lost and how sinful we have been and are, the greater his love is shown to be. So it's actually the more you talk about sin and our participation in it and how we've been forgiven of it, the more God's love is on display. So those who don't talk about sin actually have no basis to talk about God's love. Isn't that interesting? The churches that don't talk about sin have a message of love that means nothing because Christ has saved them from nothing or very little. But those who tell the truth about what the Bible says and how sinful and lost we are actually are declaring a message of love that's far greater and more true. So it's an interesting irony that the thing that we don't want to talk about is the thing that if we do, we're going to understand his love greater. That's where the catechism goes tonight. So let's read question 13. Since we've studied the law of God, the Ten Commandments, the moral law, how we are to live our life. This question now says, well, can anyone keep the law of God perfectly? Here's the law of God. Here's what it requires. Can anyone keep the law of God perfectly? There is a one-word answer that's really simple. No. That's it. No. You want to memorize the catechism question and answer? The answer is no. But it gives us more than that. It says, since the fall, so Adam and Eve in the garden, Genesis 3, since the fall, no mere human has been able to keep the law of God perfectly, but consistently breaks it in thought, word, and deed. Okay? So we break the commandments of God. So we use the term in the church, sin and sinner. The world has a different definition for those words in that title, does it not? God's definition is to sin is to break his commandments. That's what a sin or a trespass is. Someone who has broken God's commandments is a what? Sinner. By their deeds, they've proven that to be true. The Bible has revealed that those who sin, break God's commandments, are judged accordingly and because God is a God of justice and he must punish evil righteously, we then are deserving of God's holy wrath and punishment. Because we've broken his commandments, right? Now that leaves us in a heap of trouble when we look at our own life. Thankfully, God has given the solution in the Savior, right? That's kind of jumping to the end of the story for a moment. But just so you know how it plays in. In this question, if anybody could keep the law of God perfectly, we would know. Right? All throughout Scripture, every godly person you find has broken God's commandments. All throughout the Scriptures. 
So where do I get that from? Many different passages, but the main one we'll look at is Romans 3.10. So why don't you turn there with me? Romans 3.10. Romans 3.10 says this. None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Now the context of Romans is that Paul is writing to Jews and Gentiles in the church. The Jewish Christians had a lot of pride towards the Gentile Christians because they're the Jews. They had God's commandments, His law, the covenant. These Gentile believers didn't have any of that. So there was this elitism in the church and this pride, and it created a social and racial division in the church. So Paul writes to this church in Rome to tell them, Jews, you're as much a sinner as the Gentiles are. Christ died for the ungodly, which both of you groups are a part of. And so he establishes that just because you have the law, you have the commandments, doesn't mean that you're righteous. He says, no one is righteous, not even one. So he made a blanket statement, everybody in that church is unrighteous, based upon their own deeds and works, right? And he says, not even one. And then he defines it even further, no one understands... That's interesting. You and I could go, well, wait, I understand the things of God somewhat. Well, that's because you've been born again. First Corinthians says the natural man cannot understand the things of God for they are spiritually discerned. We need the Holy Spirit to understand the things of God. Think back on your life. Maybe you didn't grow up knowing the Lord. Maybe you had a time where you tried reading the Bible or you heard about the gospel and you're like, I don't get this. I don't understand it. And here you sit today going, I understand it. Something changed. Suddenly, this thing that blew my mind, I didn't understand or didn't want anything to do with, now I get it more than I ever did. Evidence that the Holy Spirit has given understanding into the things of God. That's what regeneration does, being born again. Dealing with our sinful nature, which we're going to talk about in a moment, and depositing God's nature by the Holy Spirit into our life. So instead of just sinning in our thoughts, words, and deeds, we can actually do things that are good and pleasing to God because He has enabled us to do so by His Holy Spirit. And so none's righteous, no, not one. And that's where we come to this doctrine called the depravity of man. And this is how it's played out in the church. Um, St. Augustine in the 4th century was one who argued that Man is holy in sin, uh, totally depraved. It doesn't mean man is completely evil. That's not what this doctrine says, is that you and I are completely evil in all of our thoughts, deeds, actions, words, and our desires. No, there's, there is good in us. The Bible's not saying there's not good in you. It's not saying there's not good in unbelievers. I've met those who want nothing to do with Jesus who are extremely kind and generous. Forgiving, loving, maybe not God's love being displayed, but they treat others who love them well. There is a capacity for good. But total depravity says that sin, when it came into the human race and creation, completely corrupted every aspect of who we are. Okay? So, our understanding and our intellect has been darkened and corrupted by sin. Our base or fleshly desires, our sexual desires, our desire for food, for pleasure, all these things have been corrupted and directed towards sin. Um, every, any aspect, our emotions, you name it, has been affected by sin but it does not mean that they're totally consumed by it. Put it this way. You take a glass of water. 
pure water. Take a drop of cyanide, poison. You drop it in the water. That one drop has made the whole glass what? Poisonous. So then anything you pour out is not pure poison, but it has poison in it. So before we come to faith in Christ, in our nature, sin has affected our will, our desires, our intellect, everything, and we are spiritually dead. So then anything that comes out of our life is tainted with the poison of sin. Even the good things we do are touched by sin's evil influence. We can do good things for the wrong reasons and it makes it sin, right? That's how sin has affected you and I. But do we have a capacity for good? Yes. Now, some churches have argued that sin has affected us in every way except for our will. So our free will is pure and undefiled by sin. And if left alone, we could willingly choose God or not. So it's up to us. The Bible would say that we are spiritually dead, that our sin has affected our will, so we would not desire God nor seek Him unless God was the one influencing us to do so. So we are then in need of God's grace to give us the desire to want Him, to pursue Him, to choose to follow Him. Those are all things that come from Him. And the desire to repent and turn from sin, God says it's a gift that comes from Him. That He has given the Gentiles the gift of repentance, Acts says. So, if we are in need of repentance, yes, we make a very real choice to repent. But we ask for God for the grace to do so. To no longer live in that sin and pursue it, right? So how sinful are we? Very much so, is the answer. But it gives us a time frame. It says, can anyone keep the law of God perfectly? It says, since the fall. So that tells us that there is a change that happened in Genesis 3 when Adam and Eve sinned by breaking God's one commandment. Sin came into all of creation. So sin, sickness, death, all those horrible things we deal with in life came into creation and human experience on that day. So since the fall, nobody's been able to keep the law of God perfectly. But that tells us that before the fall, Adam and Eve had the ability they could have kept God's one commandment. They didn't have a desire or a propensity to sin. They were get, made good and in a relationship with God and they had the ability to do what was right. We know that they chose not to. Ever since that day, the Bible tells us that all those who were born naturally of Adam and Eve have been sinners by birth. Everyone born in the line of Adam and Eve has been born in sin, conceived in sin, brought forth in sin. And so we have a sinful nature that Adam and Eve did not have. Now what does it mean by no mere human? Why would it say that in the catechism? Right, so is Jesus a mere human? No, he's different. So what that tells us is the sinful nature that you and I received from our forefathers. Jesus did not receive that same sinful nature. That, have you ever wondered why the virgin birth was so important? Why did Jesus have to be born of the virgin? I mean, couldn't he have just been conceived by Joseph and Mary and still been our Savior? No. Because he would have received a sin nature from Joseph and yet his nature comes from his father. God the Father. So that's where the nature of God came but also he had human nature that was real and now Jesus was born in the same condition that Adam and Eve were. 
pre-fall condition. So he didn't have the sin nature at work in him from the beginning where he found himself lying without anybody teaching him to lie. Anybody teach their kids to lie? Comes really naturally, doesn't it? What about the desire to do bad? I mean, you tell a kid, hey, don't touch that. What do they really want to do? Touch it, right? Are not adults that way too? How many people like to be told what to do here? Anybody? Or what not to do? You know, if somebody kind of leaves you alone, most of the time, you're not going to have this desire to do this thing that you wouldn't want to do. But the minute somebody pipes up and says, hey, you know what, you really shouldn't do that. All of a sudden, inside you're going, oh, why do I want to do it so bad right now? It's because somebody said no. And when God's Word says, you know what, don't do that, what is that internal battle? That's our sinful nature being drawn to it. I want you to think about the movies that are in culture right now. What movies do we watch for entertainment that we're drawn to? In our culture, it tends to be dark movies. I mean, how many happy marriages do we like watching in the movies? We don't see many. Or if we do, it's some fictitious, unrealistic idea of a relationship rather than a real one in all of its glory. But you have darkness. Look at how dark the movies have become based on when you were a kid. We're drawn to it. Even the heroes, there's a darkness to them. And there's this idea that a villain can be the good guy. Have you seen that trend? That's happening in the movies a lot. And it's this way of where in our nature we're drawn to the dark. We're drawn to the hidden things. You know, if I'm sitting there watching my boys, they're, they're pretty good, great. What happens when I turn my back? And they think dad's busy or not watching. It's like all hell breaks loose. They're thinking, ooh, we can do whatever we want. And I look at that sometimes and go, man, I got the same thing. If it is unchecked, I could be just as rotten as they can be. Any one of us can. And I think the doctrine of total depravity reminds us that the only reason we have not completely imploded in our life and shipwrecked our faith is because God's good grace at work in our life. And that if God were to withhold His grace for a moment, you and I are absolutely capable of every kind of evil that we despise. That we think we could never, ever do. And so we see within the Word of God the high standard of of his truth and what our conduct should be. The law reveals how far we have fallen and how capable we are of doing more evil. And yet the love of God that comes in by the power of his Holy Spirit that changes our nature, that makes us a new creation in Christ, where the law of God is not a burden, but a blessing for us to follow. Where we actually desire the things of God rather than put up with them or give lip service to them. But we actually love Him, know Him, and want to follow Him. That's, that's when things change. That's when things are different. And so we see here that no mere human has been able to keep the law of God perfectly, but Jesus did. He was born without sin. You want an example of the sinful nature that those who are born again, Paul wrote this of himself. The Apostle Paul clearly knew the Lord, right? And look what he writes in Romans 7.14. Romans 7.14. I'm going to try to cover a lot of scripture to make some of these points. 
Romans 7, 14. Speaking about the law of God and its purpose, Paul says this, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh sold under sin. When he says he's of the flesh, I mean that he is sinful by nature. Sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. Anybody felt that way before? Like, why did I do that? Why did I say that? For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Anybody relate to that? We can find ourselves doing the very thing we hate instead of doing the thing we really want that's really a good thing in the Lord. We can do the bad things that we really don't want to do, but we find ourselves doing. He says, now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law, that is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. That's the sinful nature, right? For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. So in your nature and mine, in who we are as human beings, nothing of spiritual good actually resides in our person. Any good that comes out of us is not of us. It comes from an alien source, something foreign to our nature. And that's the Holy Spirit. It's God's presence at work in our life. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. So we have this conflict. This spiritual battle. This wrestling between the flesh and the spirit. And later, Paul says in that chapter, who will deliver me from this body of death? He's going, look, sin is coming from my bodily desires. So God deliver me from those things. And this is an expression of us left to ourselves trying to do it on our own and our own ability. So where does the ability to follow Christ, to turn from sin and live according to his commandments, where does that come from? It can only come from the Lord. It can only come from his Holy Spirit causing us to be born again, bringing about his good will in our lives. And that's why Ezekiel 36, 25 through 29 is so important. Because it's a promise and a prophecy of the Old Testament of what God would do in the New Covenant, which you and I, if we believe in Christ and have been baptized into His body, the church, this is what He has promised to do for you and me. I will take away your heart of stone, He says. And I will give you a heart of flesh, meaning it's soft again, not hardened by sin. And I will give you a new spirit. I will put my spirit within you. I will wash you clean of all your uncleannesses, meaning washing away all your sin. And I will cause you to walk in my ways. I love that one. You've heard me quote it multiple times because it is a promise to me that God is going to work in my life because I need it. He's going to walk, work in your life because you need it. That he never intended you to try really hard on your own, in your own strength and ability. But to follow him in love and grace and rely upon his gracious work in your life and in mine. That the obedience that comes from our life actually comes from him. And the more we yield ourselves to him and surrender our lives, the more we see Jesus living through us the more clearly seen His love, grace, and truth are in our lives. And so, are we lost in sin? Totally and absolutely. Can we be saved? Totally and absolutely. That Jesus is not a mere human, but He is our Savior. You want to talk about how sinful we are? Look at Psalm 51, what David said. Um, look at there real quick, because it's a it's another one that supports Romans 3 and nobody being righteous. Psalm 51. And, and this is why it's important. Because some people believe that if their good outnumbers their bad, they go to heaven. 
Ever heard that? Anybody? If you're good, outnumbers your bad, you're good. Now, where do they get that from? Not the Bible. That is not anywhere in the Bible. It actually says in the Bible that if you have broke, if you have kept the law totally, but broken one commandment, you are guilty of all of it. Put it this way. This is how that, if you're good, outnumbers your bad, falls apart. Let's say you have a friend. They murder somebody. Okay? How does human law deal with that? Well, what if the person, every day of their life since then, devotes themselves to the good of humanity, does so much great good for other people, but they've murdered somebody in cold blood? Will that person be forgiven by human court system? No, because great evil was done. They are a murderer and they deserve the punishment for that sin. No matter how much good they do, it doesn't erase the evil that was done and the life that was taken, right? So why do we as individuals or some in the world think that, well, that's how God's going to judge me, that my good outnumbers my bad? Nope. He's going to say, have you kept my law perfectly? No. If you've broken one of the commandments, you're guilty of them all. That means all of us deserve God's holy wrath towards evil. Well, you might be going, well, how is God loving if he's going to send people to hell? Ever thought of that? Well, because God is good and just. And to be good and just, he has to deal with evil. Right? And I've used this example before. Pardon me if you're sick of hearing it. But if there's an individual who has taken one of your family members, done all kinds of evil to them, and then taken their life, and they're standing in the courtroom and you're there and the judge has all the evidence laid before him and everybody else he clearly is guilty of all these things of what he did to your loved one and the judge looks at him and says you know what I'm going to forgive you and pardon you for everything you've ever done right here you're forgiven you can go free well that great evil was done to your loved one it was done to you because now they're not in your life how would you feel about that judge and his judgment it would be unjust and he would not be good he would be evil because he is now condoned and authorized and allowed the killing of your loved one that judge is not good and yet people want God want to think of God that way that well God will just forgive you no he has to pay for the evil whoever did it has to pay for it or there's a substitute so how can God be good and merciful? How can he punish evil and yet save a sinner? That's where the cross comes in. He allowed a representative, just as Adam was our representative who led us into sin, Jesus is our representative who leads us out of it. One act of sin, Romans 7, brought death to all men and all sinned, and one act of righteousness brought life and eternity to all men. So God's totally just. Well, one man screwed it up for us all. Guess what? One man gets to make it all right. And that's what he did in Jesus. And so, on the cross, Jesus took all the penalties for your sin and mine, dealing with evil so God would be good and just. But he also shows his grace and mercy by forgiving the sinner by allowing his son to be our substitute. So he stepped in and he took the full penalty for sin, being both good and just and also gracious and merciful. There's no greater truth in all the world. There's no greater love than that love Jesus showed for you and I on the cross. 1 John 3 says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we would be called sons of God. John's saying, look at it, guys. Look at God's love for you and me. Look at how great it is and how great a sin we have committed and how great He has saved us from that punishment. How great is His salvation was a common theme throughout all of Scripture. I think sometimes we've forgotten how great His salvation is. I think we take it for granted. 
I think we've heard it so much that we just don't even spend time to think about how much he's forgiven us. How much he has loved us. How much he has brought us through when he could have just left us in our mess. But we're told that we cannot keep his law perfectly and thankfully Jesus did. Um, how sinful are we? We're conceived in sin, born in sin. That's all Psalm 51. I said we'd read it. Um, I totally got on a tangent. Hopefully it tied in. But uh, Psalm 51, real quick, so you hear the words, not just from me, but David, after his sin with Bathsheba, said this, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Here we go. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Did he not ignore his sin for over a year? Hiding the sin with Bathsheba, the adultery, hiding the murder of her husband. Yeah, he knew his sin was before him, but he tried to play it off. And then God sent the prophet Nathan to expose his sin. This was written after the exposure. He says here, For I know my transgressions, my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned. Now that's not totally true. David sinned against Bathsheba, against her, her husband Uriah. He sinned against many others. But primarily, when somebody truly repents of sin and changes, they understand that their sin has been against God first and foremost. And he's the one they've wronged. And they are grieved by it. One of the most difficult things in raising kids is when they have done wrong, it's been clearly explained, there's a semblance of understanding, but there's no sorrow. Sometimes they're sorry because they're in trouble. They're sorry because of the punishment being experienced, but they're not sorrowful for the rift they have caused in the relationship. There's a difference, right? I think if we as believers grieved over the sin we have done to the Lord, we'd see Christ present in our life much more. I think we'd have such a foundation for grace and love and truth if we were able to see ourselves clearly in light of that. Because I know those who have been on their face over their sin. And I know those who have just agreed with what the Bible says, but never really grieved over it. Never really realized how lost they could be right now. And how different their life could be, if not for the grace of God. But those who have been on their face wrestling with their own sin have been the ones who have been lifted up in the arms of Christ to walk in newness of life. It's an amazing thing that God does when we fall on our faces and we speak truth about our own condition. This truth tells us of our own condition what I like about the catechism, it's actually from the Westminster Catechism that it mentions this, but it says that we consistently in, have broken his law in thought, in word, and deed. And I think sometimes we focus on deeds, just evil deeds. What about evil thoughts? Can we sin in our thoughts? That's where the deeds come from. In our thinking, and sometimes I think we can judge our own selves by the standard of, well, I didn't do it. I thought about it, but I didn't do it. You can have the thought and overcome the temptation and not sin. It's not wrong to have the thought. It's what you do with the thought. It's if you receive it and dwell upon it and delight in it or pursue it, that's where sin is conceived. But we all have different thoughts that can be evil in nature, but it's what we do with them, right? Look at some of these verses I found about our thought life. Sin in our thoughts. I'm just going to shotgun them at you because we don't have enough time. Psalm 139.23, if you're writing them down, 
Psalm 139, 23. David says, search me, O God, know my heart, try me and know my thoughts. God knows our thoughts. David wants him to search his thoughts for any sin in them. Proverbs 12, 5. The thoughts of the righteous are just. The counsels of the wicked, however, are deceitful. The thoughts of the righteous are just. Okay, look at this one. Proverbs 15, 26. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord. They are sin. That's why Jesus says, if you lust after a woman in your heart, you have already committed adultery with her. Sin in the thoughts is a real thing. So can we sin or be in sin because of our thoughts? Yes. That's why the New Testament says we are to be renewed and take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Don't let your thoughts just go willy-nilly whatever sinful road we want to go down and think, well, I'm not going to do it, so it's okay. No, no. Don't go down those roads. Have a short leash on your thoughts. Bring them back into obedience as best you can and by God's grace. What about sinning in word? We can't sin with our words, can we? We can, really. Hmm. Sobbers. Sobbers. <laughs> Psalm and Proverbs. Sobbers. For the sheeple, yes. Psalm. You guys should have forgot that. That's not very kind for you to remember that. Psalm 39.1. I said, I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth with a muzzle so long as the wicked are in my presence. Wow. Some of us need to be muzzled sometimes. Let's be honest. <laughs> Amen. Psalm 59, 12. For the sin of their mouths, the words of their lips, let them be trapped in their pride for the cursing and lies that they utter. You. Ecclesiastes 5, 6. Let not your mouth lead you into sin. Let not your mouth lead you into sin. Isaiah 6, 7. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. Isn't that interesting that the symbol and the sign that his sin had been atoned for is a cleansing of his lips. That's why James says that the tongue is a restless evil set on fire by, the, by hell itself. I think sometimes our words are the most evil things that come from our life. The most damaging, the most cutting, the most evil that we do. And sometimes we excuse them because of the things done to us that spawn those words. But we need to be careful that the evil done to us does not become evil done by us. It doesn't justify, does it? But it's easy to fall into. It's easy to do that. So we can sin in word and we can sin in deed. That's an easy one. Psalm 144.4 Do not let your heart incline to any evil to busy myself with wicked deeds. Why do we do wicked things? Because our heart is inclined towards evil. It is. It's something we have to be honest with. Um, anybody, there's been individuals throughout church history who have believed that you can reach a point in your life where you no longer sin. Be run away from anybody like that. Because the Word of God says that if you say that you do not sin, then the truth of God is not in you and you are a liar. We all do. And the catechism reminds us of God's truth that we sin in thought and word and deed. Consistently, it says. Now, can we get better? Can we grow and not sin as much in these areas? For sure. And I think what's important is the trajectory of our life. Are we getting better at these things? Getting better at sinning in our thoughts and words and deeds? Or are we getting better in doing these things in righteousness and allowing that to be the condition of our life? So can we keep the law of God perfectly? No. So then what in the world is the law of God for? Right? If nobody has ever gone to heaven because they have kept the Ten Commandments, which nobody has except Jesus, 
who is not a mere human. He's more than that. He's God in the flesh. If nobody's kept the law of God perfectly, then how did people get saved in the Old Testament? The same way you and I do now. The faith of Abraham. The one who believed that we are children of God if we have the same faith that Abraham did. Don't think for a moment that people got saved in the Old Testament by keeping the law. Not a single person in all of human history has gone to heaven because they kept the law. We're told that no one is justified by the works of the law. Romans 3.20, For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. When you look at the Ten Commandments, the purpose of them is to show you how you and I are to live, what morals should govern our life, but also how we have not kept his commandments. We have then become sinners, guilty of God's wrath in need of a Savior. You can tell people about how they need Jesus, how they can have eternal life in Him, but if you don't establish that they have broken God's commandments, deserve His wrath, then there is no reason for them to ever want salvation. Because they don't know that they need it. They don't think they deserve wrath or punishment. So why would the message of forgiveness mean anything to somebody who doesn't think they've ever sinned? But when we come to grips with our own sin, because we've inherited it from Adam and confirmed it with our thoughts, words, and deeds, we then suddenly are brought to the beautiful realization that there's only one solution for our condition. And it's Jesus. Believing in Him, living for Him, and having the Holy Spirit present in our life. It's the only solution. It's the only means that a sinner like you and me can be saved. And it comes because we can't fulfill the law. But Jesus did for us. And instead of us paying the penalty for our sins, Jesus did it for us. I think we have a lot that we should be thankful for. And I think, and I hope, tonight is a reminder of God's love for you. See what kind of love, great love the Father has given us. Look at this great salvation. How can we neglect so great a salvation, the Apostle says. So don't neglect it. Find great joy in it. Remind yourself of what God has saved you from and what He has saved you for. He has not just saved us from something. He saved us for something. And that is a life lived in Him and for Him. And we will not be content until we're living that type of life. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. By the way, if you want to look up a further explanation of this issue of the sinful nature, I encourage you to look at the Heidelberg Catechism, questions 5 through 12. Specifically 5 through 8. Amazing answers to this. Far better than honestly what this catechism gives us. But the Heidelberg Catechism questions 5 through 8. You will not be disappointed. What's the name of that app again, Walt? Reformed Companion. Okay, Reformed Companion. If you look that up in the App Store, Walter told me about it, I don't know, a couple months ago. I failed to mention it. It is a really great app, Reformed Companion. You can bring it up on your phone and you will see every single one of those questions and more from all the catechisms and creeds you could ever want that are historic to the Christian church, you will find them in that app. Okay? It's a great one, free resource, well worth it. All right? Why don't we stand and pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your great grace. The word great in front of grace does not even, it's not sufficient in any way. We don't even have words in our language to adequately describe your grace or your love or the joy we can have in you. But Lord, I thank you that your law has revealed our sin. That we have sinned. We're guilty before you. Which makes us sinners. But in your great plan, in your redemption, through the gift of your Holy Spirit and the gift of faith and repentance, we have come to faith in Christ. And because of that, our sins have been removed 
And instead of our unrighteousness being upon us, you have clothed us in your righteousness. So you look at us as if we have kept your law perfectly when we clearly have not. But you treat us as if we did. And Lord, I can't even begin to realize how great of a gift that is. But I pray that we would realize it more. We would realize the peace of God that we get to rest in. The forgiveness we've come to know. The depth of love we get to explore because of all that you have done for us that we could not do on our own. Thank you that you sought us, that you have saved us and are saving us. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that your life would be more evident that you would take over more and more areas of our life, that we would be wholly sold out and living for you in every way. Cleanse us of our sins, we pray, and fill us with your righteousness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. God bless you guys. Thanks for coming.